going to have to dock Dallas's pay. He's uh, not doing what he's supposed to back there. All right, if you have your Bible this morning, I invite you to turn with me to, uh, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Can you turn me down just a hair, Mandy? Uh, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 9 at the end of the message. Uh, so if you want to find your place there uh, and mark it, uh, but we'll get the majority of our text from the book of First and Second Samuel. Uh, yes, I said both. So the first passage that we'll look at together will be First Samuel chapter number 18, if you want to find your place there after uh, marking your place in, uh, in Hebrews. Last week we were looking in the book of Hebrews and the title of the message was Christ the Superior Covenant uh, in which we uh, talked about Christ being the superior high priest and how he carried out uh, the duties of the priest once and for all uh, for all the sins of man and, and we talked about how that he is the mediator of a better covenant and we uh, put a lot of emphasis, a lot of focus on that mediatorship of Christ and uh, this morning I want to revisit uh, that same thought of Christ as the superior covenant uh, but with our emphasis this time being on that word covenant instead of mediator and uh, I'll have to give credit where credit is due I was going to Billings Monday and uh, I turned Adrian Rogers on my, my podcast and was listening to him and uh, the message come on it was uh, blood covenant it was part one and two, and, and as I listened, I thought, man, that's, that's beautiful how it goes along with uh, the covenant we talked about last week, Christ being the superior covenant, and that, that thought, these ideas that he brought out, the points, uh, just stayed in my mind all week in my study, and so uh, I'm going to use some of the points from his message that he used uh, today and the, the goal, the point of, of this is that we will see Jesus completed the covenant and that was started long ago in the Garden of Eden and how we should respond to that covenant. And we'll, as I said, get to Hebrews eventually, but first we'll start here in, in this covenant that we'll cover between Saul, excuse me, David and Jonathan. David and Jonathan, Saul's son. And so let's read uh, just four verses here in, in chapter number 18 uh, to kind of set the stage of where we're at. Uh, of course, chapter 17, David has just slain Goliath, and Saul is wanting to know who David was, whose son he was, and, uh, and knowing about him. And then it says in verse uh, 1 of 18, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. And so, as I said there, we see this example of a covenant. And the, the three things that we see uh, about this covenant uh, it speaks to the covenant that Christ made on our behalf and so uh, the, the thing about this covenant uh, most of the time in the Old Testament when you read about covenant or in the Bible in the whole uh, it's usually referring to splitting an animal in half and the two parties of the covenant would pass between the animal that was the sign of the covenant that they had made with each other uh, but scholars believe, scholars say, uh, from what I've tried to find, uh, I know this is what Dr. Rogers had said, uh, they believe here in this covenant, though, between Jonathan and David, uh, this was a blood covenant. That's what that word uh, covenant there you see in verse number three, uh, the Hebrew, it, it, it refers to a blood covenant. Uh, but they believe that they would have slit their wrist and, and caused blood to flow on each of them or maybe even in the palm of the hand and they would shake hands where the blood touched and mingled 
And so it showed a, a sign of unity between the two, the bloods coming together. And uh, I couldn't find nothing biblically to, to support that idea. But again, a lot of scholars believe that this is the covenant that it's talking about here. And, and of course, our mind goes to Christ, his stripes, that, that blood from the, the nails uh, that he bore on the cross. Uh, you know, it, I can see some Christology in there. But uh, anyways, to the message... Uh, we see this was an example of a covenant. They've made this covenant between one another. They're blood brothers. They're, they're together. You know, I, I never did it as a kid, but I've heard of, you know, making a cut in your hand, shaking hand with your best friend, and now you're blood brothers. Uh, but uh, that's where we're at. Uh, but what I want us to notice from these four verses is uh, the three things that Jonathan gave to David. It said there's three things there that, <coughs> excuse me, he gave him that's um, representative of our covenant with Christ. The first one is, I uh, said, Jonathan took off his robe that was on him and gave it to David. Now, this robe would have been his royal robe as the son of the king. He was the priest. He was the heir of the throne. This was his symbol of authority of, of who he was. And so he took off his person. This robe, again, was a sign of who he was. He took it off. He gave it to David, and he's saying that, that my person is yours. You and I are like one. We're, we're together. Uh, then it says he took off his garment or, or his armor. And so this would have been his outer protection, his, his outer clothing, and, and this represents his possessions. And so all that... He was saying, all that I have, David, is yours, and vice versa from David to, to, to Jonathan. And then thirdly, we see that he give Jonathan, uh, he give David, excuse me, I'm going to get these names mixed up the whole sermon, so bear with me. Uh, Jonathan give David his weapons, and by doing that, that represents his power. And so his ability to fight, he's giving it to David, and he's saying, your fight will now be my fight. Your enemies will be my enemies, and again, vice versa. And so uh, he's, he's given his power to David in this covenant. And so that's the sign of, of commitment that he's committed to David, and David likewise committed to Jonathan. Uh, but secondly, we see, uh, if you'll turn with me to chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, just a few pages over. Verse 14, we'll start a reading there. And again, this is a conversation between Jonathan and David. Uh, David is about to flee for his life because Saul is trying to kill him. Uh, and so uh, David talks to Jonathan about it. They, they set up this plan. But before they carry out the plan of knowing whether Saul would accept David back into the kingdom or not, uh, verse 14, I'll quit rambling and read. And you shall know... You shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. And so here we see uh, this sign of kindness. Now, in studying this week, that word kindness has spoken uh, beautifully to me. It, it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing when we understand what's being said here. Typically in our culture, when we think of kindness, uh, we think of being nice to one another, right? That's what our moms always tell us, be kind to your brother or, or sister or vice versa or whatever. Uh, but that's not the picture that is found here in the Bible. It's not being nice to one another that that word kindness is the same hebrew word that actually translate to loving kindness and ephesians 4 32 let me turn it out at market so bear with me ephesians 4 32 paul said uh, talking to the church at ephesus and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And so again, there that word uh, kindness. He said, "Be kind to one another." Uh, that word means 
mercy, merciful, forgiving. And so it's a beautiful word there when we see uh, that, that Jonathan is asking David to show kindness, to be merciful to him and to his family because Jonathan knew that David would be the next king. And so he's asking for David's kindness, his mercy. And, and you know, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for that loving kindness that Christ uh, has given me, that he has shown to me. Again, Paul, in, in chapter number 2 of Ephesians, he says this, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace have you been saved. So again, that mercy. He says, But God, who is rich in loving kindness, in, in mercy, uh, he, he saved us, even in our dead and trespassed way that we were in. And so we see that sign of kindness. Now, if you will, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter number 4. And so, so far, we've set up the covenant between Jonathan and David. Uh, we've seen how that Jonathan pleaded for kindness, that mercy uh, from David. And here we'll introduce a, a character that uh, will play an important part of the rest of the sermon. Uh, we'll read in verse 1. Let's see. When Saul's son heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he lost heart and all Israel was troubled. Uh, now Saul's son had two men who were captains of troops. Uh, excuse me. Go to verse 4. Verse 4. Jonathan, Saul's son, okay, same Jonathan that David made the covenant with, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that she fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. And so here we introduce to a character by the name of Mephibosheth and what uh, Dr. Rogers said in his message, uh, he said, is there any ladies here in the congregation? Of course, the church he pastored was, was huge. Uh, he said, this would be a great name for your baby. And, and could you imagine uh, that name going over today, Mephibosheth? Uh, it'd be fun to say anyways, but unless you have to get on to him a lot and say it a lot. Uh, but so we see this, this Mephibosheth, he's, he's, a man now at the time that we're, we're looking at, uh, we see that he was crippled. Uh, it says that this lady, his nurse, his caretaker, when he was five years old, that's when Jonathan and Saul were both killed. And when they heard news of this, the house of Saul was fearful. They thought, well, David will take the throne. He'll come in and kill all of us and get rid of the house of Saul so that he can establish his uh, rule in the kingdom of course, we see that still today in our government systems. When a new president takes office, he replaces the old cabinet's uh, members with his own. And so they were fearful of their life. And so they, they cut out running. And in their haste to flee, it said, uh, this nurse tripped and fell and landed on Mephibosheth and crippled his legs to the point that he could no longer walk. And so we see that he's crippled. And we also see that he's living in a place called Lodibar, and the name of that place literally means uh, no pasture. And so it's a desolate place. It's a place of, of despair. And so this, this crippled man, Mephibosheth, living in a place of desperation, uh, living in a place of despair, but then something happens that changes Mephibosheth's life. Uh, Second Samuel chapter number 9, I know we're doing a lot of turning, but I've I hope you can keep up with the, with the passages that all come to play here in a minute. 2 Samuel chapter 9, we'll read verses 1 through 6. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him, there's that word again, kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? 
Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of uh, Makar, the son of Emil, in Lodibar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Makir, the son of Amil, from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Here is your servant. And so what we see here is David seeks kindred of Saul. And here we know through reading this what David is looking to do. He's looking to show the kindness that he and Jonathan had uh, made that covenant about uh, in earlier chapters that we read. Uh, but Mephibosheth has no idea that that's David's intent. But David seeks kindred of Jonathan, and uh, he comes across this servant by the name of Ziba who remembers about Mephibosheth, the child, uh, when Saul was, was uh, on the throne. And, and so he tells David about Mephibosheth. And so not only does David seek for Mephibosheth, then he sends for Mephibosheth. He says, go and bring him to me. Uh, I want to meet him. I want to talk to him. And, and so we see when Mephibosheth gets there uh, that David shows kindness for Jonathan's sake. Pick up our reading again in verse number 7. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake. And will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself, and he said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belongs to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And we see Ziba did as, as David had commanded. So David shows kindness for Jonathan's sake. He restores to him all that he had lost he gives it back he said all that was Saul's I give to you and we can only imagine that as Mephibosheth walks into uh, the the presence of David there he's he's probably scared to death he thinks okay this is it King David he's he's wanting to get rid of any of Saul's lineage and and so he's brought me here he's going to have me killed uh, but right the opposite happens David shows him that mercy that that loving kindness and so Mephibosheth has a choice he can either accept David's mercy and find favor with the king or he can reject David's mercy and return to his life of desolation and fear of his own life he can go back to the way things were uh, thinking that David was this terrible person who was out to get him living in this place called Lodabar of desperation uh, having to be waited on because of his uh, crippledness. Now, here's where this becomes significant to us. We find ourselves in Mephibosheth's shoes. Uh, what I mean by that is, wh what do we know about Mephibosheth that relates to us? And the first one is, he was deformed. And so, as I talk about, he was crippled by the fall of another. As this nurse rushed out of the house with Mephibosheth um, certainly in her arms trips falls and cripples him uh, when Adam fell in the garden that left a crippling effect on all of mankind and so uh, this this fall uh, brought a deformity on us all and so then we see that Mephibosheth he was dethroned uh, when Saul and Jonathan died uh, Mephibosheth lost his inheritance to the throne of Israel because Samuel had already anointed David as the next king and so he lost his inheritance and when God created us humans and put us on the earth he did so for, with the purpose of the man having dominion over the earth 
but again because of that fall we lost that dominion we lost that inheritance and, and, and so we find ourselves in a place of being dethroned lastly we see that he was dead uh, Mephibosheth said himself he said he said what am I I'm just a, a good as a dead dog he's putting himself in a low position before David he says I'm I'm as good as dead king because I'm of the house of Saul who sought to kill you and so again we like like Mephibosheth because of that fall we have death we have separation without Jesus Christ we're all as good as dead we're all in our trespasses of sin and sins uh, again Paul writing to the church in Ephesus he says and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin and so we were dead but through Christ through this new covenant uh, we are restored and so now if you will turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9 Let me grab verse 13 of chapter 8, and then we'll go to verse 11 of chapter 9. Uh, verse 13 says, In that he says a new covenant, uh, he, God, has made the first obsolete. Now is what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And then uh, here in the first 10 verses of chapter 9, uh, the writer talks about the earthly sanctuary and the earthly service. Uh, and I'll pick up my reading in, in verse number 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of bulls and goats, uh, blood, excuse me, goats and calves, uh, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And listen to verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So that promise, that's a promise that's made through the covenant between God and Christ. And it shows us the promise that David kept in the covenant he made with Jonathan. The covenant is now completed. It's now fulfilled. Christ came as the spotless, sinless lamb, give himself on the cross for uh, the justification of our sins. And so through this new covenant, we, like Mephibosheth, have been sought. David sought for Mephibosheth just as Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. Not only did Christ sought us, he bought us. Christ paid the ultimate price that we could not pay for our sins. It was a once for all time sacrifice. And so then we were brought through the covenant we're brought into fellowship with God just as Mephibosheth was restored all that he had lost and he was seated at the table of the king. David said that Mephibosheth will eat at my table continually here's what Dr. Rogers brought out about that and I thought this was good it, he said as Mephibosheth sat there at the table of the king and that big banquet tablecloth that covered the, the table covered that crippledness of Mephibosheth so as long as he was seated at the king's table his deformity was covered nobody knew about his deformity nobody knew about uh, his his, his past, his, the things that he lost or, or all that that had been restored to him. And so we are brought before the presence 
of God through this new sacrifice, this new covenant, excuse me, and, and we're given a permanent place with the king. And so that new covenant, what a beautiful picture that is uh, that we find there in that covenant between Jonathan and Saul, excuse me, Jonathan and David, and then ultimately David uh, fulfilling that, that covenant through Mephibosheth. There's so much more to salvation than what we, I'll say realize, but that's not really what I mean, what, what the lost world realizes. There's so much more to salvation than what the lost world realizes. Uh, it's more than what we oftentimes think of. Uh, we see through salvation we have an atonement for our sins. But we also have access to the Father. And then we also have an assurance of eternity with Christ. And so we have atonement, we have access, we have assurance through the new covenant. The covenant of which Christ is the mediator of, the covenant which is the better, the perfect covenant of God and his people. So in closing this morning, I would ask this question. Have you surrendered all that you are? Jonathan gave Saul that robe. That was his person. Have you given all that you are? Have you surrendered all that you have? As, as Jonathan again gave that garment, that armor to, uh, to David, symbolizing his possessions. And have you given all that you have? will be your power have you given that surrendered that to Christ we have and by all means we can praise God for the covenant that he's made with us through the blood of Christ but if not why not why not today why not put your faith and trust in Christ the one who gave himself for us the one who is this mediator of the better covenant. If you would stand with me this morning as we'll be dismissed. Before we do, though, I, I, let's do that song again, Mandy, that, that last one we did.